Hello, welcome everybody to this very special what is not what is what the F. We don't say what we have today. What is SRE for managers? So we'll just we're just going to do a bit of bit of housekeeping and give people a chance to come into the webinar and get settled in, get a cup of tea or whatever every it is they're doing. There's currently about 28 people uh, here. We're expecting a couple more, so let's just hang around for them. In the meantime, let me tell you the story of this webinar. So way back, Carla, when was it? February? Well, for Cisco, it was even end of 2019. 2019, well, when, when did we do the first big webinar? What the F is SRE with Nathan? Oh, that was February. That, indeed, that was in February, yes. So for those of you who don't know the story, we, one of our most popular webinars um, back in February was with Nathan from Google. And that was what well, was called What the F is SRE. And then that led to this really huge uh, conference that was uh, put together by Cisco and Container Solutions about SRE and of course that's led to this specific topic today what is SRE but for managers so for all of you who have been along the whole journey with us welcome back uh, for those of you who are new Carla or Tracer will share the links back to the conference videos later on today in the, in the chat and then you can check that out and check out all the uh, uh, previous uh, uh, webinars that we've had this year in terms of housekeeping I think the most important thing, let's talk about code of conduct for just 30 seconds. We do have a code of conduct. It can be summarized as be nice, be kind, be respectful. Obviously, we apply the same rules here in the virtual event as we do in a physical event. Code of conduct violations are taken very seriously uh, and we have ways to handle people who breach it. Send a direct message to any of the facilitators today or especially to Tracer and Carla, if you have any concerns. The long form code of conduct is now being posted into the chat box for those people who want to read further. If you run an event and you need a code of conduct, please feel free to take it and to use it uh, for your own purposes. We, we are committed at Container Solutions to creating a safe space for everybody in technology. And if we can help you create safe spaces too, then we're all winning. Right. Did I miss any housekeeping? It's been a while, Carla, since I've been doing this. What have, what have I missed on housekeeping? Did you mention that we're recording? Yes. Oh, yes, we're recording. So there's a very nice new feature on Zoom now, which means when we record, you have to explicitly consent. So if you're still in the webinar, it means you have consented. If for some reason you want us to make sure you don't appear uh, in the video later, let us know or we'll pixel you out so that nobody watching back on YouTube will be able to see your face or your name. Now, a few announcements before we get into the main body of the talk. Cloud Native Transformation, Practical Patterns for Innovation. This is a best-selling book. Best-selling, not, not like Harry Potter, but just best-selling in the world of people who are interested in Cloud Native Transformation. I think we must have shifted at least 30 last month. But for a very short period, this book is available free to download. It is um, the handbook. It's, it's quickly becoming the handbook for people want to become cloud native lots of people use it not just the customers of container solutions um, and so if you want to grab a copy of this now you can follow the links uh, and download your pdf version uh, right now now this is a really big announcement oh no not this one this is a rubbish announcement and we're hiring container solutions are hiring all kinds of different people this is a generic announcement because it's always true but actually right now we're hiring even quicker than usual we have a hiring event next week which is actually closed now. But if you want to check out the events page or check out our career page, it'll give you a feel for the type of work we do, who we hire, how we hire. Mainly, it's about culture and, and potential. So not everybody knows everything about Kubernetes, but if you're a good engineer with a good mindset, there's definitely a safe place for you here at Container Solutions. You can, direct, you can send me a direct message if you like, happy to talk about uh, CS. And this... Oh, no, where's the conference? We're missing a conference slide. Here. Right. It, I, think, I think I jumped over this by accident. This was the big announcement. Uh, we are having a huge conference. I think I made a mistake. I think I pressed down twice and somehow the same slide twice. My apologies. Um, this is the big announcement. So on the 4th of November, we will be running What the F is Cloud Native. So this will be a continuation of the theme, a continuation of the great work we did with What the F is SRE, and fingers crossed, 
we can't fully guarantee it because we don't know what's happening with the pandemic, but it's our absolute hope that we're going to have physical locations. Groups of people, for example, in London, groups of people, for example, in Amsterdam, broadcasting the whole conference live. So those people, for example, where the conference isn't physically, they can, they can log in, they can stream, they can ask questions, they can experience the online conference as they've gotten used to, and there'll be lots of people in the studio audiences as well. We're working on this, we're being super flexible. All of the suppliers we're working with are also being flexible because we have to navigate the COVID landscape. But you will notice we've started early. November is the conference and we're planning and doing everything to make this a success right now. If you're a sponsor or a business and you want to help out, give us a call. We'll get you on the sponsorship roster. If you want to speak, great. If you're a first time speaker, let us know. We'll help you. We'll put you in touch with other speakers. We'll help you uh, with your abstract. And we'll try to make sure that you get onto the uh, conference to, to become a speaker, public speaker for the very first time. With all of that being said, uh, it's now time to hand over to the speakers for the day. So we are gonna be learning about SRE for managers from three different people. The first one, Reinhardt from Cisco. He's gonna be speaking last. And then my two colleagues from um, uh, Container Solutions, Michael and Pinny will be speaking first. Pinny, is that right? Are you going first? I'm going first, yes. Followed by Michael. All three of our speakers today have got a very unique understanding of SRE and a different perspective. So together, the three different talks are gonna give a really broad picture of what SRE is and what it means for managers. And that will leave at least 20, maybe even 25 minutes for chit chat, Q and A, further gossip at the end. You can ask questions, especially clarification questions while the speakers are speaking. If you've got a more general question, ask it in the chat box and Carla or Teresa will make sure it gets asked at the appropriate moment. And on that note, it's time for me to stop sharing. Uh, it's time to say thank you for letting me come back. It's so good to be back uh, uh, on a webinar. It's been, a, uh, I think, a few weeks for me. I've been super busy, but it's good to see everybody again. And I hope you all take something out of this webinar. And on that note, I will hand over to my wonderful colleague, Penny. There you go, Penny. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Um, okay, so I'm going to start. And um, yes, uh, I'm not in mute, right? Because I cannot see the screen anymore. Um, all good. We can hear you. Yes. Um, right. So, my, uh, I'm, my name is Pini. I'm uh, uh, currently CRO and in the past, all kinds of other things in container solutions and co author of this book, Cloud Native Transformation. And generally coming from uh, sort of in between operations and development. So, my uh, technical background in uh, software configuration management. So I'll start with a story about myself, my personal sort of short story, and then uh, go from there to talk about maintenance of software. So this is a back of my house in Amstelveen, near Amsterdam. And one day, this part of the of the roof developed a leak, a very tiny leak, right? It's just a few drops of water. And, uh, you know, it's quite annoying. And uh, of course I can fix it myself. And that's how I fixed it. Right, this, this piece of uh, masking tape, it definitely closes the leak. And uh, this is what we call the active fix, right? So first, is triage the problem, understand where the roof is leaking and solve the immediate problem. Of course, there was another solution, which is a bowl to collect the water, right? But that was uh, not sustainable, I guess. Right, so, but is it enough, right? Is it enough? Can we just leave it here? Now, if you understand anything about wood or roofs, you know that if there is a leak, you cannot just close it from within, from, from inside the house. You have to close it from outside. And 
this how it looked like outside, right? So actually the wood was rotten. And uh, generally wood is not a leaky material, right? It's quite well insulated. So it means that uh, if it's leaking, there's already quite significant problem inside, uh, inside the beam, right? So the next thing is to find the root cause and solve that which I did by painting this uh, wooden beams. And that is called proactive fix, right? So if you have a leak, first you solve the immediate problem, sort of firefighting, then you find the root cause, you solve that, but is it enough? Right? Is this the end of the story and I can forget about this? It's not enough, right? The answer is it's a rhetoric question and the answer is it's not enough. Uh, I wouldn't be in this position in the first place if I would be painting this thing every six months or so every year uh, or inspecting it and painting every couple of years, right? If I would be investing in maintaining this thing uh, throughout the years before it broke down, then I wouldn't spend uh, too much effort in fixing it. And you can see that if I would keep it as is without painting it, then I would have to replace the roof, right? So, and uh, essentially I could get to maybe 10,000 worth of expense just because I didn't spend a couple of hours and 30 euro on uh, just laying another layer of paint, right? In different way, what it means is that if you wait until the things are getting uh, break down, until there is a major failure like the leak, then it means that you need to invest in major repairs, right? So my leak wasn't major, so I could still repair it in reasonably uh, at reasonably low cost, so minor repair. But it is still uh, it's still better idea to wait until the leak develops, right? So essentially. If you wait until everything is uh, breaks down, then the cost of repair is very high. If you see until, you, uh, until the problem develops to a minor problem, the cost is lower, but still significant. Uh, the best way is to do preventive maintenance. Preventive maintenance is, uh, is when you essentially fix things before they break down. And in different way, so, um, if we look in, into software development practices or software maintenance practices more, more precisely, and I've been working in software maintenance or in, uh, uh, within development departments or uh, general, general maintenance uh, departments, many, many development departments are operating in 100% reactive mode, meaning that they only respond to feature requests or failures in the system when they happen. So basically, there's almost no proactive work. There is no proactive improvements. There is no uh, fixing things unless they get uh, break down, right? So in this in this situation, the system gets worse and worse and worse, right? Because things break down, and you ignore minor fixes over time because you have no time because you're fully committed to firefighting, and actually, you get farther and farther in uh, uh, the whole system basically gets worse and worse over time. Um, better teams also do proactive work. So basically when they find a root cause, for example, their, uh, I don't know, server fall, uh, fell apart or they don't just restart it and then like nothing happened. They actually look into logs, they try to debug things, they try to understand what happened and they work with development departments to fix the problems, which is better, but not enough. The real, uh, uh, if we want to go all the way into proper maintenance, we also need to introduce preventive maintenance. And preventive means periodic inspections and uh, replacing components before they break down, right? So, Normally, if we think again in, in software terms, if you maintain complex software systems, there is very commonly uh, uh, people say things like, uh, don't fix it uh, if it's not broken. 
this is actually a really, really bad idea, right? If we look into other uh, industries like uh, construction or, or automotive or whatever else, we actually see that none of the industries work this way. You don't wait to fix the problem. Uh, you don't wait for, for a car to break down to fix the problem, right? So what happens really is that cars, they tell us when something is, is not functioning well. And there are all these signs um, that the car, with like all this communication uh, language that cars tell us when something is wrong, when we need to fix it, fill in the gas or take it to the, to the garage. They also tell us when something is wrong before it's too late, right? Not after things are broken, not after you run out of fuel, but 70 kilometers before you run out of fuel. So you will have still a chance to fix the problem before, uh, before you start. Also, all the uh, uh, vendors of the cars, car producers, they require periodic checkups. And if you don't do it, then you lose the warranty on the car. And during these periodic checkups, they would, uh, there would be a list of specific things to check. They will replace oil, replace, replace, replace tires, or whatever other components explicitly before they get broke, right? Before, um, for example, there is a timing belt, right? If you don't replace it in time, the entire engine uh, uh, breaks down. So if that happens, then the cost could be thousands of euros. But the cost of replacing the belt is just few tens or hundreds of euros. So every 30,000, 50,000 kilometers, it is recommended to replace it. It is just plainly stupid to wait until it breaks and destroys the engine. There are also uh, all the governments and all the, uh, in everywhere, they demand from cars, uh, demand cars to go through periodic inspection for road readiness. Um, typically every year, sometimes every two years, but you need to go to uh, certain place where they would also have a very extensive checklist. They would make sure that you have uh, the brakes work, the uh, lights work on whatever else. So you're safe, not just for yourself, but also for others on the road, right? So if we look on all those things and we see that actually none of other industries encourage the users of, uh, of the equipment to wait until it breaks down to fix it. So, but there is very significant cost to proactive maintenance, right? The maintenance is uh, those tasks, replacing oil and uh, taking the car into the garage is actually quite expensive thing. What are the elements that can reduce the cost of, uh, of maintenance? And the first very simple and consistent one is construction quality, right? So obviously if you build the software in the way that it is uh, high quality, durable, um, can survive in difficult situations, uh, reliable, right? Then the maintenance is needed less frequently. It's quite obvious thing. And yet when we build software, you know, there are people who build software and people who maintain software. Uh, and in traditional world, this separation leads to, to the uh, often poor quality of software build and then hand it over to maintenance people. And they essentially, they get, uh, they, they, this thing falls apart every time and then uh, the maintenance is extremely expensive. The other thing is observability. Now, same as with cars and all the other uh, equipment outside of software, it's essential that um, people who maintain software understand what's going inside, what's going, uh, if, if things are, for example, the system is running out of resources or there is something that is just about to break down or there is some potential security holes or whatever else, it's very important to, um, to understand what's happening. Right? So the same as with the cars, if the user doesn't know that the engine is just about to explode, then they won't stop on the side and, and uh, let the engine cool down. Uh, it is very important to have components to be, not to be built for a specific purpose, but interchangeable. Right? For example, your 
using CI-CD system, if you build in, in a way um, that uh, strongly binds you to a specific tool, for example, Jenkins has these scripts. If you run, uh, if, you, if you build uh, uh, those or write those scripts that are tightly couple you to Jenkins system, and later on, once you want to replace Jenkins with something else, uh, it basically becomes impossible, right? So the ability to replace different components like CI, CD or deployment to the cloud, the cloud itself from one cloud vendor to another uh, makes it easier to replace broken things or, or things that are not good for you anymore with, uh, with alternatives. Uh, inspections and, and uh, checklists, right? Again, during the maintenance in traditional uh, enterprises, very often no one really knows how to maintain software, right? There are no checklists. There's just like, if something breaks down, I will just come over and you know figure out what's going on and fix it. It's not exactly uh, an engineering thing. It's more just, you know, firefighting, just I'll, I'll come over and fix it. Um, Replacement parts, uh, lots of replacement parts. When you fix something, then uh, you know you need to be able to replace, uh, for example, a server with another server. That becomes very easy if you are on on the cloud instead of uh, uh, with physical servers, right? So their the ability to replace a container with another container is uh, uh, trivial. It's uh, it's almost non-issue. Um, upgradeability. So this is one of the most common maintenance procedures, with, uh, which is ability to upgrade the system. If the upgrade is difficult, then people will tend not to do it, which creates a, a sort of drift away from the latest software, which uh, uh, almost by definition reduces the quality of the software because the, uh, the producer of the software continues improving it. And if you are not upgrading it, then it deteriorates in quality. Um, there is a very strong tendency in our engineering teams to choose latest and greatest, right? All these very cool and fancy tools that are really amazing and really solve problems in modern ways. The problem is they are unknown, right? Unknown tools, they are predictable and we know how to fix them. So if you go on Google, if you choose some fancy tool and you Google how it breaks down, you, then you cannot find the solution because it's new and uh, still not well explored, right? So it, it breaks in unpredictable way. So actually, if you want to reduce the, the cost of maintenance, it's, uh, it's typically better to use known tools. And uh, yeah, obviously redundancy is, uh, is an important point. So if something breaks down, but, but the system keeps running, then uh, uh, you can take your time to fix it later on. Right? And uh, the same thing is degradation of service. So if, uh, if the system, uh, if something is broken, it doesn't mean the entire system collapses, right? So if you're, for example, watching Netflix and the recommendation engine is not functioning, that is fine but it's uh, maybe not as good as, as having it functioning, but uh, at least people can watch the movies and pay for them. And uh, the next level, which is more advanced uh, maintenance is, uh, you can see it also in other industries, right? Like in, uh, uh, with airplanes or with uh, boats, it's, there's always emergency drills, right? What's going to happen if, uh, an emergency happening, right? How we are going to respond. In more advanced software maintenance teams, you see a lot of emergency drills and a lot of chaos engineering. So they are intentionally breaking things to, to see how they can deal with them in real life and in, uh, in, uh, uh, in reality, right? And uh, the other things, uh, Michael is going to take over and, and continue talking about them, but essentially the more advanced uh, maintenance procedures are based on uh, proactive maintenance on error budgets and SLS and SLOs, and they encourage people to um, 
continuously improve their software, not to stay where they are, not to keep the, the quality on the same level, but continuously invest in improving the quality of the software to reduce the maintenance cost. Um, and it's very important, the same as with cars, it's very important to let the operators, the maintenance people to know when the things are going to get uh, worse, right? So if the car is just about to run out of fuel, it's essential that we will know about it before it's too late, right? So the systems need to be designed in a way that they don't break down unexpectedly and take the entire system. Like if one component breaks down and takes with it the entire system in sort of cascading error style, then uh, uh, those systems are extremely difficult to maintain and, uh, and I would consider them poor quality. So, at the end, maintenance is, uh, is very important because if the system is down, is the quality, if the quality is poor, then that's the face of your company towards your customers. They see every failure and then you lose, the, you lose either direct revenue or reputation. The problem with maintenance, it's, uh, it's invisible. Right? It's only about negatives. It's only visible when something wrong happens. It's about preventing pain from happening in the first place. Yes. So maintenance is all about negatives. It's never about rewards. Doing it, it, is, uh, doing it is a pain, but not doing it can be catastrophic. And um, that's uh, more or less about the maintenance. And uh, again, the emphasis is not just remain with reactive maintenance and even proactive maintenance is not enough. Um, what's important is to continue and do preventive maintenance where we fix things before they, they break down. And that's it. And I can hand over to Michael, unless you have any actual questions. You can uh, download the book or look into other things in these links and uh, Carla will put the links in the chat to make it easier. Okay, I will. Uh, I, uh, I, I had a question around chaos yes. engineering. Are you going to talk about chaos engineering in the next uh, slide or uh, in, in detail? We will briefly touch it, but not on detail. I will go okay. in it, but not like. OK, all right. I think I, I will stay here, so I will also also be after after michael finished and uh if the question is not answered then we can try to answer it together perfect thank you um, Continue, yes. sorry very quickly there was a comment in the chat as well about how to read the diagram and he's saying that the diagram seems to suggest that normal where minor repair and major repair happen with the same uh frequency yeah, so it's the point is that the failures will happen on all levels, minor, major, all kind of failures. There is no way to build a system that doesn't fail. I mean, I, we can look at in uh, any field, and uh, I cannot say what is the right balance between major repairs and minor repairs. But generally speaking, we need to try to repair things before they get broken. That's the main message. Same thing when I say sword to press or sword is uh, uh, firefighting and sword is uh, preventive and sword is uh, 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 proactive. It's not about sword exactly. It's not exactly 33.3%, right? But generally speaking, if you're 100% in firefighting mode, then that leads to deteriorating quality of the software which leads to even more investment in maintenance, which leads to even poorer quality. And it's a downward spiral that leads you into terrible results. Right, that's the main message. And, uh, and to do, uh, to basically unblock yourself, you need to invest in proactively solving the problems and not just fixing the uh, symptoms. Thank you, uh, Christian. Hope this answers your question, but feel free to follow up in the chat and Pini can also reply there. Sorry, Michael, over to you. Thanks. I hope you can see the slides. Yes. And I 
just take it now where Pini left plus a bit more other things. Yeah, that's me, Michael at Container Solutions since quite a bit. And hopefully I do share a bit of insights about SRE in the more detail or other details. I uh, just want to start with 100% um, availability is considered harmful. So that shouldn't be the target of our work or any work of an SRE. There are two terms in this spectrum that fly around and some people use either or, but there are differences. So availability is a percentage of the time a system is operational, like up and running and doing fine. And reliability is basically, I know what my system is doing, I can predict, and it's meeting its defined performance criteria. Availability, a lot of people try to aim for the highest availability possible and are happy when since six months we haven't been down. So often that's, well, luck, not nothing more, and it shouldn't be your target. There are only a handful of systems that should aim for 100% availability rockets you want to get the people back from space if do you shoot them to mars or wherever medical devices and nuclear plants your websites or ours or pokemon go that should be reliable of course but it shouldn't be a hundred percent available the cost would be tremendous i go into that part why well, most likely users even can't distinguish between 100% availability and something below. And I would even go by far lower, not just like five times. I would say no user can distinguish between 100% and 99%, especially in the nature of the websites and Pokemon, for example. As I said later, the websites and all the things, they should be reliable. And what that actually means, we will hopefully go into it. SRE, the R is basically reliability engineering, not availability engineering. There are the differences I've just mentioned. It should be predictable. I should know what my system is doing and how it is, behaves and basically put all effort in getting it in a state where I know what it does, but not to meet all the time 100% or whatever uptime criteria. So it's reliable, not available. No, that's <clears throat> there are diff no, that's one too much. Huh? Where does it come from? I was missing that slide. Um, it de developed in early 2000s at Google. They did it by themselves without any input. They faced challenges when with operating their systems. They asked some software engineers, how would you basically build an operations function? Out of this came SIE. It was independent of DevOps. It shares some of the same things. Of course, you should work together, all these kind of things. The major difference, though, is SAE, because it was an internal thing, prescribes how SAE should do things. Where DevOps, it's more on a high level. Hey, automate your um, well the development practices, put it as fast as possible and automate it, test it into production, all these kind of things, but not like it is this or that. SAE does that. If you read this three books from Google with more than 500 pages, you know what I mean. There are a lot of details in it, which are quite helpful, but not all need to be um, taken into account. The major differences between DevOps and SAE are the DevOps um, is more this T-shaped people, deep experience in one specific area, and then whatever else in that team is required. Usually it's end customer projects like product development. It's still a you build it, you run it kind of thing. So when you build something, you should operate it. Um, whatever they automate, it's more around delivery, getting it from code commit to production. The KPIs are the usual business metrics. They optimize for lead time and the value delivered. And usually most of the time is spent on feature development and stuff, dev work. 
and usually done doing Scrum. On the other hand side, if you look at SRE's main traits, engineering teams with reliability focus, they do platform and or engineering projects with the focus on toll reduction. They run infrastructure and your apps, all your apps, depending on how you set it up. The automation is focused on operability. So toll reduction, we come to that. Their KPIs are more SLOs and error budgets, can you mentioned already. They optimize for number of pages, operational load, mean time to repair, mean time between failure, all this means to something. And they split their time 50-50. 50% is operational work and 50% is spent to keep it below this 50% threshold. Okay, so it's great, but why this is now coming up? First, of course, Google engineers speak now more public about SAE, and then, of course, it gained quite a bit of traction with um, the book publications, and now the value gets seen, but why is it so? <clears throat> Imagine a standard DevOps team following the Jeff Bezos two pizza team rule, like it shouldn't be bigger than two pizza. No, the team should be able to be fed by two pizzas, which means five to seven people. They should do product development plus 24 seven because they do this stability running kind of thing. That would mean that if a team has five engineers that are capable and willing to do on-call, that would mean that in a typical setup, almost every second week you would be on-call. If you're on-call, you never sleep that well, not just because you might get paged, but just carrying the page around has an impact on your sleep. And if you don't sleep that well, you don't concentrate up the next day, at the level you should, then you make mistakes, they go potentially into production, more errors, more getting woken up, and so on and so forth. You build it, you run it was kind of the idea. If you need to run whatever you produce, you pay more attention to its quality. I don't believe in that. And as we see, it might even be counterproductive. So SIE is still like a bit of a split between operational tasks and 24 seven and the team who is doing product development, which doesn't mean code gets thrown over the fence. But how do they achieve the collaboration while uh, maintaining reliability and feature development? That's the main questions. The guiding principle of an SLE is they regulate their own workload. They work with SLOs, SLIs, and a lot of this things, we go into that, but with consequences. Guiding principle one uh, is also tomorrow should be better than today, and failure is an, an, an opportunity to improve. How do they regulate? First, there's a lot of terms flying around. SLI is one of them. Service level indicator, SLOs, that's the main thing talked about when people speak about uh, SAE. That's basically a number, blah, blah, blah of time or a number of requests, this kind of things. SLOs form the SLA, I, and an SLA is basically consequences like the penalties if you don't hit your SLIs. So multiple SLIs and SLA. Now it's not going further, but yeah, now it is. Well, here we are. There are nines. Nines cost just money because it's complexity. There's just the standard table of availability targets and basically what it means uh, in terms of error budget. We go into details like this. The higher you go, the more complex it gets. This is the more important graphic. I stole it from Google. Um, it's like how an SLO basically gets triggered or when does it eat up budget as soon as it, is, as it begins, not like if someone notices this kind of thing. Error budgets are important to balance what I've said, like reliability versus product development. You shouldn't use 99 dot something as in the discussion. It's 
the invert to use in that case 0.15% as a budget. That's your credit. You can you should spend it on a monthly basis of whatever your SLO window is. And this is basically what you impose on your customers. You say, hey, 0.15% is acceptable as discomfort towards my user. So we use it. The free budget is a joint budget between all involved parties. If you have platform engineering providing, for example, Kubernetes infrastructure, you have product development, product, so code, and SAE, and they all work on the same thing. It's a joint thing. 0 0.15 is overall. It's their thing. So if platform engineering blows it up, yeah, what a pity, but it's gone. If it's gone, then it doesn't mean nothing gets done anymore, but then the focus turns entirely on stabilizing the system, the service, what have you. Ideally, the SLO and the error budget and, well, the actual ones should be public. So everyone receiving your service should be able to see how your service is performing. The benefit of working with error budget is that it's a common incentive to work towards that goal, to stay beyond, because this is basically what we, if we would blow it up, then our users aren't happy. Unhappy users means less revenue. So we want to stay below. So it's an incentive to balance, I don't know, product development and innovation versus reliability. And everyone basically uh, shares this um error budget and everyone is basically then responsible for keeping it the teams manage the risk by themselves they decide how to spend it if hey we almost end of the month something we have still a lot of time left why not just releasing something we anyway want to try if it's unrealistic like hey we should be five nines available that will soon yeah, be unattractive because it's unrealistic and nothing gets done anymore. The budget would be blown after each release, kind of. And as I said, it's a shared thing. Each team is responsible for it. If it's too high, as I said, it's unattractive. People don't get stuff anymore into production. If it's too low, well, users might run away because the system is too unreliable. So you need to find the balance. If you look at the graph on the bottom, it's the percentage of happy users I want to have. And then on the X, it's like, how much does it cost? And then you see at a certain point, you could make, of course, more users happy, but the cost is not linear. It's more exponential. Costs are not linear to the percentage of happy users. So, so at a certain point, would you get more revenue by making more uh, users happy, or would it just cost exponentially more for a minor amount of more happy users? And this is the conversation the teams and the stakeholders usually have. Uh, peep, peep, doesn't work. So these teams continuously improve whatever they are doing. How? Hey. Blameless post mortems. Whenever something happens, it's not about identifying who fucked it up. It's more about why did it happen? Why did someone, well, why someone could do whatever change or whatever thing instead of where was the countermeasure? Why did nothing um, catch the issue or the error or what, whatever? Why we didn't have the test for this case and then fix it? Automation, automation all of all the things, reduce the toil, fast feedback, and as I said, automation, that's the thing. That's basically making all the time things better. Whenever something is done manual, it's error prone, so automate it, improve it. Um, if you're at the level that you are quite reliable and whatever you are doing, nothing happens anymore, then if your humans aren't enough to cause stress on your system, then chaos engineering comes into play. 
So you artificially create failures. Um, Netflix called it chaos monkey. There are other tools and things around its resiliency engineering. Other industries are doing this already, pushing things to the limit and see how and what falls apart. Um, in technical terms, it's injection of errors, latency, packet drops in cloud, like shooting nodes uh, uh, out of a cluster, bringing down the entire availability zones, all these kind of things. You define basically the blast radius and the thing, but it helps you to see what issues in your infrastructure is. And well, usually it forces decoupling of systems, what Pini also mentioned, if service A falls apart, service B should still be up, like the recommendation engine of Netflix, for example. There are different levels of adoption in beginner mo mode. Well, do it, but do it in a test environment. And if there is a, an issue, file a bug, GitHub repo, however you work, Jira, and then wait until it's fixed. The next level is already in production, but during business hours where someone can immediately act if something is falling too much apart. If you're beyond that stage, then you're at pro level, just do it continuously 24 seven and see what happens. You will see all the time when there's a new release, the system might behave differently. And this chaos engineering, you find some nice and weird reactions. Um, when people or companies attempt to implement, uh, go into, ah, let's do SAE, it's often treated as the infrastructure level only responsibility. It's not. Availability or reliability issues are not purely infrastructure related. A nice example how successful SAE might look like is the thing from that's Facebook. It's Facebook's auto remediation service. What this thing does, it's like it processes 4 billion notifications per month, filters out 99.99998.75%, which is considered noise, just thrown away. And then 99.7% of the remainings are auto remediated. This thing is developed and maintained by two SAEs. And it basically does the job of previously 250 system admins. This is what toil reduction actually is. This also shows SREs are mainly, not purely, but they have a software engine background. They are really good on system engineering, but they do know software and how to write it. SAE is about keeping your users happy. It's about managing innovation of features versus reliability using contracts and formal processes. And of course, as Pindy says, man, maintain all the things. They can do that, but it requires not the silos, it requires collaboration. And I hope I stayed within time, I guess. And now questions. I don't have the chat, so I don't know. Someone needs to tell me. There's no questions in the chat, um, but people can. Oh, yeah, we've got one. Where is security? DevOps team, SRE team, and other security team? No, why? Security, that doesn't change. Security shouldn't be a gated thing at the end. It can be a dedicated team. That doesn't matter. Um, but as all the other things, it should be an enabling team, not like there is now a dev team and an SAE team. And still at the end, there is a security team with manual check or, uh, um, checks and a gate, which well, basically prevents flow. That's a matter of detail. Security in general, well, needs to also be part of the whole value stream. That also means optimize and flow. Pinny raises his hand. But we can't hear you. No, I'll touch on that just a bit as well. I'll say security is everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and bringing those processes forward, bring them 
um, you know, it's continuous and we'll all touch on that just a bit and we can talk about it more in the chat. Well, now a lot of questions as I see, I'll go one by one in that case. Uh, so I put a tick box at the security. <laughs> the next one is mm -hmm. for companies who are just starting building as a e team, what do you recommend, how to approach it? The main question is, first, you need to answer by yourself, what, what are you trying to solve? And then how to start? I mean, all nifty crifty details, you don't need to go full swing at, at first, but there are basic things in it. So like this arrow budget thing with, if it's blown up at the beginning, of course, you need to find the right balance. But when you are at the point like, hey, we are happy with, if we would hit that, we manage user expectations. The biggest pressure usually then is the POs or product owner, product managers are like, yeah, they still want to have this feature by now. And then pushing back and like, Stability, not feature is now the, the thing. So we need to fix this, 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 and this first to get back before we do something. That's the biggest challenge. And it's an organizational challenge. It's not just, hey, we do SAE. Because if, if you're not set up in this way that you can push back and nothing gets, not, not nothing, but features are not getting delivered, this kind of things, then it becomes quite a challenge. Okay, I often hear managers swing for cares. Sorry, engineering. Michael. Sorry, can I pause a moment? Yeah. I would like to, to make sure that also Reinhard has his, uh, his presentation and we can Fine. keep some of the questions for the end of the Perfect. session. Uh, yeah. Or if you want to start uh, re replying to some of them in the chat. Oh, ah, well. yeah, that's also possible. Thank you. And I'll share my screen now. Excellent. So if, uh, yeah, we go percent mode and we're set. Um, thanks, Carla, for doing the presentation. I'm, uh, we're doing a little thing on the fly here. Carla is driving the slides and I'll be talking. So we'll see, uh, we'll see how this works. So apologize in advance for any fumbles between the two of us. Um, so yeah, so the last two, the last two uh, well, Carl, um, Penny and Michael were talking a lot about kind of the, the some of the, the details and implementation details in SRE. I'm gonna take a step backwards here uh, and talk a little bit about the organizational context of SRE. And it actually touches a bit on the, that last question we had. It was like, how do you start implementing SRE? And so if, uh, so the, um, so if we go ahead and uh, uh, go to the next slide here. Um, so I, I will say, so I'm, I'm a director of SRE at, at Cisco within a particular group. Um, everything that we talk about, everything we talk about SRE, everything we do in our work life in general, whether it's DevOps or SRE or anything else, you know, context matters. Where we're coming from matters um, and, and how we approach things matter. Um, so my personal background is I come primarily from SaaS operations, um, from email security to ed tech to, uh, to WebEx. Um, all sorts of different sizes, from five five person teams up through up through uh, thousands of person teams, and uh, and uh, most recently, I'm working in the uh, Cisco's Emerging Technology and Incubation Team, where where my SRE team is supporting multiple ventures. and And um, and what I'll, one thing I'll say is that SRE and the practices of SRE, the practices of DevOps, are different in all those organizations because because they have to all of these are people and technical systems, and we have to pay attention. To the systems as a whole, which I'll which I'll touch on. So, um, Carla, it doesn't work very well for me to uh, look at my phone and tell you next. So we'll just say next slide. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we we over time we've we've seen the evolution of operations from from organizational silos, uh, ops and engineering. And when people would talk about engineering, ops versus engineering, and it's really product engineering, product silos. Um, implicit in that conversation, by the way, was that ops personnel were often not engineers. Um, operators were, were not necessarily software engineers. Um, over time, we started introducing concepts such as DevOps and, and, uh, and the, 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 the conversation, the tools around um, collaboration between the development and operations teams. 
um, over time in the same kind of vein, we were, we, we were developing platforms where we were creating operational systems where software wasn't running in isolation, but we were starting to run on common platforms, things like, um, things like uh, um, uh, platform as a service, the original open shifts and cloud foundries or Heroku's uh, into Kubernetes. Um, the, all of these things were evolving over time. And so if we go to the next slide, um, today, as we, as we are operating our systems, we're kind of expecting just about anybody touching our production systems and, and even our pre-production systems, because we, we try to run those in the same way as we do production systems, to be engineers, um, to be either software engineers, um, infrastructure engineers, systems engineers, but they're taking an engineering approach to doing their job. We're not, we're not following tickets, you know, filing tickets, responding to the tickets. We're, we're, we're building systems. And I think, uh, you know, in the, uh, you know, in, in the SRE book, which we'll talk on it, touch on in just a minute, they say, you know, SRE is what happens when you ask a software developer to do operations. It's like when we start using automation and tooling to do our jobs rather than processes, procedures, and tickets. And so in this context, over time, the, the, the evolution of DevOps, the emergence of platforms, um, in the, if we go to the next slide, um, in March of 2016, this book was published. And it really stuck a label on, on some of the practices and things that were being done. Now, it was very much in a, a Google organizational context, and it described some of the particularly interesting things that they were doing in their world. And they put names on some of the, some of the practices and things that were evolving um, in the industry, and then introduced um, some, of the, some of the special things, in particular, the, the, the SLIs and SLOs that, uh, that Michael just talked about. Um, were really were really brought to the fore in this book, but it really put a label. And a lot of times, when we put labels on things, um, it really helps um, bring a conversation together. So, if we go to the next slide, um, the um, site reliability engineering um, and the the title itself is interesting because um, in these next few slides, it's like, well, I have an SRE team, and I don't actually have sites. Um, by and large, we're not actually operating sites in our world. We have a, a, a large number of, of things that are running uh, behind the systems in our SaaS businesses, often hundreds of microservices, most of which are internal, um, scores of, of what I call not microservices, our backend systems, our databases, message queues, um, and all of these things are operated, all of these things are deployed, all of these things are managed. Um, I, I kind of laugh at, at some of the, the focus on microservices because in real operations in a real large structure, we have all sorts of different systems of all sorts of different sizes. And so when we talk about SRE and SRE teams, we're not just concerned with the operations of this, of this new cloud native microservice running in this thing. We're, we're looking at the systems as a whole and not just the sites, but, but all of the things around those sites. And if we look at the next slide, um, reliability. So um, yes, reliability is, and the, the, the SRE book really touched, you know, talked a lot about reliability, but in our production, modern production systems, we're not just consumed about reliability. And so our SRE teams, um, all of the SRE teams I've been involved in and the SRE team I'm running today, you know, we're, we're as concerned about velocity, feature velocity, new development velocity, getting features, getting new releases, getting new products out as we are reliability. And a big part of that is that is that balance of, of, of um, you know, error budgets and being able to, to have the right tooling and mechanisms in place to measure, are we going too fast? Are we not going fast enough? What are we doing? But it's also the systems that allow us to do these things. And so in a lot of organizations, mine included, we have SRE being responsible for building those systems which enable velocity, which enable compliance and security. Um, and, um, and yes, reliability is important, inclusive of data integrity, inclusive of performance, because reliability from a customer's perspective, you know, a, a badly performing system is, is, looks kind of the same as a broken system. <laughs> it's to them, it's same things, so, um, the, the service is down. And so, uh, so reliability, you know, SRE is not just about reliability, it's also about these things, velocity, compliance, security, et cetera. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, the, um, the one thing I will agree in the uh, SRE, it's like, yeah, it's, it is about engineering. The SRE, the SRE teams are first and foremost engineers. They are either, either software developers or doing systems and process design. A lot of the people in my, in my um, 
on my teams over the years have actually come from non-software backgrounds. They're coming from business process, industrial process, uh, chemical engineering in one case. These, these systems, systems are systems and, and the way we treat and manage systems. Um, you know, these are um, uh, people doing these systems are first and foremost engineers. Um, one thing that I see a lot happening right now is what I call SRE washing, just like we saw cloud washing in the, in the past. Um, I you know recently saw a, uh, um, some folks in, 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 an, in another org actually talking about uh, the Knox were calling themselves SREs. And it's like, okay, um, are you actually working on engineering and process and toil reduction and everything else? It's like, no, we're, we're just, uh, we, we like the name. <laughs> it sounds better than, it sounds better than operator. Um, and so but beware is in a lot of our, our um, organizations. The other, the other thing is, you know, much like, uh, you know, people saying I'm a DevOps, which kind of saying, okay, well, you're saying you're an automation engineer. That that's cool. Um, that that's a useful and, and useful skill. But but really, let's not diminish that the point of DevOps is collaboration between developer and operations teams. So if you if you create a if you create a DevOps team, it's like are you creating another silo? So silo. So the uh, SRE versus DevOps. One one way you might look at this is that in the DevOps world, we uh, we are focused on individual optimization, optimization of individual team. Actually, Michael described this pretty well with the, with the, uh, with the two pizza teams uh, focused on kind of the, the optimization of this local thing. Um, product engineers paying attention to how the thing is operated, operations engineers following de development processes, all in, the, all in the kind of what we talked about in the past quite a bit of you know, value stream mapping, how are we optimizing the delivery of this thing? Um, I would argue that in SRE, we're primarily concerned with the sum of the systems. Um, if I have 150 microservices team, each with their own DevOps processes within there, I'm really concerned in my world about the sum of those systems, these, these systems that are talking to each other. When we talk about uh, capabilities, when something's broken, it's always on the, it's often on the boundaries of things. It's, it's, uh, it's not a piece of software stopped working. It's the front end can't talk to the database or the, or the, uh, the message queues are backing up because something's happening in storage or whatever else. And so in SRE, we tend to look at things um, as a whole across the total system. We're looking at emergent behavior that's happening across and then we're setting standards for, um, um, for expected behavior of the system, what we expect in terms of applications exposing them, uh, their, their, um, uh, uh, they're, they're the, the, both the knobs and how they're configured as well as, um, as well as how they're performing things like health check interfaces, that type of thing. And so, uh, so I would argue in, in most organizations, SRE becomes the team that, that looks at the system as a whole. Um, now, SRE teams do follow DevOps practices. And so, you, so you'll find, you'll be hard pressed to find the systems that SRE is running for the main management of their systems. Yeah, we're following DevOps practices ourselves. We're using the same tool chains that you might use to deploy um, applications, to, to deploy infrastructure and manage those types of, those types of infrastructure things. Um, so, all right, next slide. Um, as, we, as we do our job in SRE, um, one of the things that I find very useful to think about is, is shared services code and knowledge across an organization. Um, you know, if we have lots of product teams, lots of engineering teams working in their two pizza teams or other, other constructs, um, uh, one of the things that we do in SRE is to take these, the common things, the things that are done across those multiple teams and make them a common practice. Um, do that undifferentiated heavy lifting once in the organization. We don't have to have every team trying to figure out how to do code scanning um, for security. Um, uh, we don't have to figure, have every team trying to figure out how to do uh, monitoring and, and, and creating different and disparate systems to do these things, which then impede the ability to reason about the system as a whole. And so we, what we do is, you know, in creating these common services is how do we, how do we share what we're doing across these teams in terms of services that are run on behalf of other teams, code, which we create together and share. And, and we don't really care where that code comes from. Maybe it's a Maybe it's a development team that created something that other development teams will, will then reuse. Maybe it's the platform team creating common tooling for observability, whatever, and, and just knowledge. We'll touch on some of these things in a minute. So next slide. The, uh, one of the way to think about systems in general, uh, my bullets got really weird here, but um, you know, 
we talk about non-functional requirements. I'll talk about that in just a minute, but uh, in fact, I'll talk about it right now. Non-functional requirements is one of those things that makes my head explode. Um, it's like, what's more functional than the system is running? It's like, so to, to, to think of non-functional requirements, just, just kind of it's like, okay, wait a minute. Um, our job is to run systems that run. Therefore, everything is these, these non-functional requirements are the key requirements of the system. But anyway, that aside, doing these things that we kind of tend to bucket non-functional requirements, things around secrets management, code scanning for security, penetration testing, uh, managing image repositories, tracking bugs uh, uh, and CDEs against the software run, we're running. All of this stuff is overhead. And if you have, um, Michael actually described it really well. If you have these two pizza teams that are trying to do all of these things in addition to developing features, they're going to be completely ground up um, in, and not get any actual software development done. So the question is, how can we make how can we pay the taxes for them? How can we do some of these things in common practices, common tools, common um, ways of doing things and actually pay your taxes for you? So yes, all of these non-functional requirements are taxes, but my job is to pay your taxes for you, or at least as much of them as I can. So if we go to the next slide, the um, shared services, we touched on this a little bit. Um, in, in our world, actually, um, you know, how, how do you get software to production? Well, a, a new version of software, if you're, if you're responding to a bug um, in, uh, in something that is not behaving as, it expect, as you expect it, the way you push a change to that is your build systems. Therefore, build systems are production systems. <laughs> if the only way you can push a new thing to, to production is through build, then build has to be as available as the rest of your systems. Furthermore, there are things that we do in operations that we don't wait um, to the point of the last question, and, and Michael touched on this, we don't wait until things are in production to do security scan. And we do that all the way up in the process um, during our build process, whether it's security scans, whether it's test code coverage scans, whether it's inclusiveness scans to make sure that we're not using non-inclusive language in, in, the, in the code that we're producing. All of these things need to be shifted into build systems. And so in our world, actually, the SRE team is responsible for... Um, running and interfacing with teams beginning in those build systems. And that's where we start introducing some of the practices and things that will matter later. Um, deployment. Uh, deployment is, a, you know, it's really easy to think about deploying an application, um, configuring and deploying an application. But when you do that in production, where you're doing blue-green deployments across multiple environments and multiple clouds, having to deal with secrets um, in, a, in, a, in a secure way, um, being able to do um, the things you see here, dark launches or blue green deployments, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of tooling and practices that are built to doing around that. And furthermore, you don't want every team having to do, if, 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 uh, if an environment requires 30 different uh, microservices running in that particular environment, you don't want to have 30 different ways of managing those teams. So how do we abstract out those processes and make them the same? And then, of course, there's the runtime systems, the, the, the Kubernetes platforms that most of us are running on today, the monitoring systems we use for observability. Monitoring, in my world, by the way, is inclusive of, of logging and metrics and traces and alerts. And there's a lot, there's a lot you can talk about. Well, there's entire conferences built around monitoring alone. I mean, it's a key aspect of SRE, but, uh, but it's not the only thing, as I'm trying to show here. Um, platform, you know, these platform services. At the time I left the WebEx Teams group, uh, the platform services accounted for 32 services um, versus the 100 product services that we're running. So it's a, it's a significant amount of the stuff that you're running as an organization. So if we go to the next slide. Um, shared code, I'll touch on just a minute. Um, one of the ways that we, that we work with our peer engineering teams um, is through common libraries and code. Some of the most famous ones that you'll see there are things like OpenTelemetry, Zipkin, et cetera. Um, the goal is to not build monitoring over and over and over again, not build configuration management like our interfaces to console um, um, for, uh, for distributed configuration, uh, application configuration. Um, you don't want to go reinvent those things over and over and over again in, in multiple teams. And so you build a set of libraries that everybody's using. We call it the WBX core in the, in the WebEx world. It's now called something else. But, uh, but anyway, it's core tools that we're actually producing that other teams are consuming Again, it's, some, it's usually built in combination with the engineering teams and then everybody uses those libraries. So um, Netflix is rather famous for their, for their suite of, of libraries. Um, 
Another aspect of this is infrastructure as code, the stuff that we're building and using to actually deploy and run our systems. You know, those are in the Git repos like everybody else. And so if an engineering team wants to change to the platform, um, they can just send us a pull request, right? It's like, now we do have people who are specializing in building infrastructure. And so, you know, maybe the request will come in, hey, will you do this for me? Or maybe it's an engineering team looking at our code. Oh, I see how you're configuring these things. Hey, I want to, I want to change this value, send us a pull request. And so we interact with teams, uh, adjacent teams, and the shared code is a big part of our, as an engineering team, we interact with other engineering teams through code. Um, so next slide. Uh, shared knowledge. Uh, this is actually a pretty key uh, part of SRE. Your average product team, your average product developer probably has not run a large scale system in production, um, especially if you're hiring you know, new, newer engineers who are, you know, operations is not something you just know. Um, you know, building operable systems, building re re reliable cloud native systems, you know, there's a lot of history, a lot of experience, a lot of, hey, if you do things this way, it'll make your life better. Things like the 12 factor app, what do those things mean? Why do we do these things? A significant part of our SRE job is actually interacting with other teams to say, hey, this is what it means to run this thing in operations. These are the things that will come up tomorrow. Um, it goes the other way as well, though. The things that are learning, that things are happening in individual orgs, how do I say this product team learned this? How do I apply this to all the other teams? And so um, and so we do, uh, if those of you who are familiar with the Etsy tribes and guilds um, kind of model, it's, uh, this, this is something that's actually worked pretty well for us where we have, where we think of the SRE team largely as a guild as opposed to a specific team where we have people who are performing SRE functions that are, that are actually embedded in an engineering team, but they're, but they're watching out for the practices of SRE across the org. So next slide. Um, these common practices, uh, you know, the value of common practices across these, I think we talked about, you know, how do we implement these things? How do I implement things like, uh, you know, SLI, SLO, how do I implement code scanning? All of these things, if any team does this individually, it's hard to do a good job. You do the minimum possible thing. We talk about it. We, 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 we glamorize the MVP, the minimum viable product. Well, I don't want the minimum viable security. I want the best possible security. And the best way to do that is to develop it once and reuse it multiple places. So having these common practices and common tool sets helps promote maturity because I can mature that common thing and then have multiple people who use it. Actually, um, Penny was talking about the, the, the car as, a, as an example. The car is a great example of where we have an enormous maturity in the individual components that we're using. It's like Ford, there's no way Ford or BMW or Mercedes or anybody is going to build tires as well as Michelin. Um, Michelin builds the best damn tires um, around, well, I guess uh, Yoko, uh, the other, other tire manufacturers might disagree, but, uh, but they, they are experts at building tires and they build the best damn tires and everybody else just uses their tires. Um, uh, starters from Bosch, uh, you, name, you name your thing. Uh, the best possible tools are, are being developed and reused across these multiple systems. And that happens in SRE as well. Um, a big part, another part of this uh, common practices and tools is, is having engineers be able to be mobile in order to you know, work on this individual project and now go work on the other project. If we're using common tools and practices, it's a whole lot easier from a management perspective to be able to, to move engineers to projects that need attention. Um, and then, this, uh, this, uh, I, I was amused seeing on Michael's slide. The, 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 you know, you build it, you run it. Um, yeah, here's the, here's the catch. If you build a bunch of snowflakes to build and run your thing, now you're chained to your thing. Um, if you're using common practices and common tools, then you can get help in running your thing because we have other people who know how to operate that. To use the deployment tools, to use the monitoring tools, to connect to other systems. Um, but one thing I will say about building these common systems in general, it's hard. Cooperation takes time. An individual team who's used to just, you know, the, the DevOps team who says, hey, in fact, I had a team tell me, um, you, you, don't, you don't understand DevOps. So, you know, DevOps means we get to build and run our own thing in our own way and run our own velocity. It's like, yeah, that, that is true, that, that, that you are not dependent on anybody else to have these conversations. But it also means that now you're on the hook for building and running your thing, and you have all these requirements that you have to meet. 
Um, you know, I can't pay your taxes for you if you're building your own thing. I can't help you run the thing in the future if you've built it in your own special way. And so, but it does take time and you do have to, in the organizational context, you do have to make room for collaboration, make room for dependencies among teams. Um, so um, let's see, next slide. Um, one, the, and this might be, uh, um, this in fact is my last slide. One thing I will emphasize is one size most emphatically does not fit all. The context, all of these systems we're talking about, the way we operate, the kind of the concepts, how do I apply SLIs and SLOs in my environment? Does it, are, do the SLIs and SLOs for this particular service uh, make sense relative to, to where they are in their maturity, where they are in, in availability engineers who built the thing? There's lots of variation among machines and every organization of any reasonable size has multiple generations of systems running in multiple places. And, and we don't just, generically say this is the one true way to do it. Um, we, we even see things where it's like, hey, why is, why is database management done in this team versus that team? Well, it's because we had, there was a small team and this person, person had specific expertise and, and aptitude for it. And therefore we just put it in that team because it made sense. Um, so a lot of that stuff is organic and special to the organization you're building. Um, one caution overall, you know, as you pick up those Google SRE books is, is you're not Google. Um, you don't run at Google scales. Nobody but Google runs at Google scale. Um, and the systems they have, the processes they have, even the way they run their, their repositories. Um, you know, like most of us don't run a big mono repo with all of our stuff in one place. Well, most of us have individual repos, maybe hundreds of repos. Um, and therefore the way that we interact with each other is, is different. And, um, and conversely, Google, you know, you're not if you're not Google. Google's also not you. Uh, you a Google engineer would probably have a really hard time working in a context. In fact, a lot of the tools that we see um, in our in our DevOps and and SRE space come from ex Google engineers saying, "Wow, I really missed that tool." Um, after leaving Google, I'm, I'm going to go build that. Um, things like uh, Prometheus, for example, at Spotify is a, is a good example of that. Um, so. Um, anyway, so that's, uh, that's, that's, if we go to the next slide, which is the inside, uh, that, that's kind of all the things I want to talk about, and I'm happy to, uh, happy to answer whatever questions, but hopefully it's a little bit different, different flavor than the first two, it's kind of a little bit more about the organizational context. Do we have anything queued, uh, do we have any live questions or anything queued for us, uh, Carla? Well, just uh, i've lost track of all the questions i saw that a lot of activity in the chat no new questions no new questions one second because we do have some questions that were submitted beforehand upon registration cool. um i'm gonna stop sharing So, um, okay, I, I can start with, uh, with an easy one, I guess. <laughs> what is the first thing your SRE team should focus on? Hmm. I'll take a first stab at that and then maybe I was, um, we, we tend to focus first on the things that are on fire. Um, because the things that are on fire are a massive distraction from getting anything else done. Like, like it's really hard to concentrate about on, on, you know, hey, these, these future concepts on managing these things. If, if we are dealing with outages on an everyday basis, the question is, is focus on the things that, that are killing your engineers first um, and, 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 and try to make, you know, release the pressure on that thing to give you room to start doing other things. If your engineers, uh, to, to my point, if your engineers are up all night, every night answering pages, they're not gonna be very functional doing anything else. So get that pager volume down, whatever's triggering those pages, hit the, try to hit the root causes. And, and, and uh, there's a lot of triage involved. Uh, in fact, I would argue that 90% of my job in SRE is triage. It's like, what's the most important thing to focus on right now that will give me room to work on the adjacent things? I can only agree to that. <laughs> Nothing to add. Kini, do you have anything to add? 
I think the question, maybe from different angle, is like where where to start when you're setting up a team. Where would what would you do then, right? Uh, where the team starts, and uh, and I think, of course, keeping system running is like sure that that's the goal of the well functioning SRE team. But uh, when you're setting it up, there is a very strong need to to set up the tooling and define the processes as with any other new team right so basically so we were setting up an SRA team uh, in the last year or so and the first thing they were doing was to build the tooling that they would be using to to manage the the customer load Right. So investment in, in good tooling as preparation and setting up proper processes and all the uh, fire drills and all kinds of things, what's going to happen when bad things happen. And that's where you start, even before you start working on production system. Yeah, I think that's an important, an important you know, that, that job of setting up new things and, and getting started is uh, one of the things that we usually don't have the luxury of is... Yeah is have product development wait for six months while we get our systems set up, right? And so one of the questions it's, so even that is a triage question. It's like, what is, what is the minimum viable platform that I can get going so that the engineers are now developing on the platform. So then the things that we're building for those platform, for those engineers are done in service of the next team that's right behind them. And so trying to stay, you know, trying to stay that step in front, but you're absolutely right. They're getting, getting that minimum viable platform and getting the wheels turning on that so that you're coalescing efforts on building those things rather than having things scattered is, is super important. And if you're in a position that you have a production system that you just, you're just about to release to production and it's already functioning in production and you're asking yourself how I'm setting up SRE team for that, then you are too late. You should have, you should have started six months ago, right? which is very common scenario people forget about security and maintenance and all the other things because the builders they build then hand over to maintenance oh, oh we forgot to set up a maintenance thing yeah that's one of those you know back to the kind of the shared knowledge part of the thing is is you know one of the jobs in sre and in, in my org is making sure that we're having those product conversations so that they're not they're not you know, none of this stuff is a surprise and, and people know that, hey, wait a minute, if I just do these things, then I, then I don't have to pay those taxes, as I said. But that's a difficult conversation because the, you know, many of the, many of the teams are saying, well, wait a minute, I'm not in production yet. Why do I have to deal with all these things? Yes. And the argument that I'll always make is that, look, your job, your goal is to be wildly successful. And if you are wildly successful, if, you, if your adoption of your service goes on that hockey stick, when are you going to have time? to go fix it <laughs> there's you're 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 you actually are in a place where you can adopt these things and fix these things now if you are successful you will not have time later and life will be very bad right and psychologically speaking putting entire team and probably your best team on preventing something from not happening in the remote future is a very difficult proposition one of the ways that I help that I that we we try to focus on these some of these things is you know we talk about observability and health checks and is the system running you know one of the things that helps that make that easier and what what Penny just mentioned is is to actually emphasize that the same tools that we use in building our systems the same you know it's like how do you know when you're developing a piece of code that the code is behaving right that is doing what you expect. Well, we, we try to introduce things like monitoring and logging and tracing and use the same tools that we're gonna use in production, we introduce as early as possible. So the way that we're using, and then it's not a preventing something in the future and doing this thing. It's like, we're, it's, it's something we're building to do our day-to-day -day engineering today. Um, and some of those things like the ability to do zero downtime upgrades, it's like, it's a pain in the butt to do that as an engineer. Um, but it's enormously freeing if you are released from change windows. If you don't have to wait for a change window to an up, do an upgrade, then your shackles are off in how you can do your development. So it's a little tax upfront, big benefit. And so, so part of that thing is, is, is like security, is shift left, move these things, move operability up, 
move um, and and, uh, and and there's some principles, you know, in, in, in previous team, for example, one of the principles we held in Oregon is like, we will never turn, from the day we launched our first dev pipeline, we never turned the server off, the service off. Services came, individual services came and go, but the service as a whole was never turned off. And that was an expectation we made of the team is that you will never have the opportunity to service off ever again. Um, error budgets, SLAs, those are for mistakes. <laughs> you're you're going to burn those when you screw up. It's like you can't plan. You know these these are not uh, these are not to be used for for normal operations. I don't know how relevant, but if we are talking about screw ups, there is also a question about uh, incident management uh, mm. and outages. <laughs> So is asking uh, Ricky is asking about what is the role of the SRE uh, around these these two occurrences? If an issue occurs, I will bring up the question. Ah, okay. Well, the SAE is the incident management function in that case. So they try to get the system back to health. They exercise this fire drill is all kind of this, and usually they know the system in and out, so. So we, so I, I, I agree that in general, we try, we, in like the last three orders I've been in is incident command um, has been an SRE function. Um, and uh, because you're kind of at the nexus of these systems, right? You're, you are on the boundaries of all these systems. And if, 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 after, if microservice A is failing and microservice B you know, they're, they're immediately going to start looking at adjacent systems and, you know, they're going to start blaming DNS or blaming the network or blaming the other system, anything but their own. Um, and so you're sitting at the nexus of, of this communication between teams and, and you tend to be running incident command. You tend to be shepherding and making sure people are on. Um, where I will slightly disagree with that is that we do try, as part of the build that you run it, we try to make, you know, our goal, um, and it's a hard goal and not usually fully met um, admittedly our goal is to you know get the pages to the team that matters like if your thing is failing in production you are going to get paged first not 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 sre getting paged and then forwarding that page to someone else or our goal is to actually say your health checks are failing and and that we can i can demonstrate some of those health checks where 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 if you look at a health check interface one of the things in our systems you look at health check interface it says i depend on these systems I think they're healthy or they're not healthy. And so we, we build systems back to the common code thing. And so we, we have ping interfaces on every interface. And so I can look at that system and say, your system's failed, you're going to get ping. Oh, by the way, these other five systems that you depend on are failing, they're going to get paged too. Um, so we do try to do a systems approach to that. Thank you. I think we are like right on the dot now. It's... Uh... 3.30 p.m. in London and some other 30 in around the world. <laughs> um, I would like to thank uh, once again, Reiner, Michael and Pini for the presentations today. And I can see there's still some activity in the chat. I strongly encourage to, to send any questions our way. We can see a reply uh, via email or on social. And of course, as Jamie mentioned at the beginning, we are going to share the recording of this session as well as the slides presentations. So plus other articles that you can read. Uh, there is one interesting one about the, the history between uh, Contrary Solutions and Cisco that you can uh, review tomorrow. Uh, but that's all for today. Thank you so much again for joining and I wish you all a good rest of the day.